Hello and hello everybody, my name is Lucy and welcome to Books and Brushes. So today, where did September go? Because apparently it's October now, which I refuse to believe. I swear, August only just finished. For both July and August, I read 11 books a piece, but in September I read a measly six books. But still pretty good and at least it means I don't have to edit two gigantic wrap ups, so that's good. The first book I read in September was Fire Frost by Mill Longley. This was my second ever net galley book. If you know about my first ever a NetGalley book, then you'll know that didn't go well, but I still decided to continue on with NetGalley. I couldn't just leave it at that one dreadful and walk away. My second book was a much bigger success than the first. This book it is a high fantasy, hate to love romance story. Heavy emphasis on the romance. It's set in a very high fantasy world with an epic, intense love story, all about hate to love and an intimacy, and if that's all you want to know, I support you because I didn't really know anything about this book going in. I'd completely forgotten what this book was about when I started it and I had no clue what it even was so it was a nice surprise for me if you don't want to be spoiled by the inciting incident and everything that happens because it's impossible to talk about it without spoiling some of the beginning then I highly recommend the book I thought it was really fun if you love romance you gotta love romance and if you like high fantasy elements go for it it is a brilliant book so I will leave a timestamp if you just want to skip any spoilery details but if you're here because you're thinking look Lucy I got a bajillion books on my TBR I'm never Never gonna read this book you might as well just talk about it a bit more then welcome to the spoilery section so this book is set in like I said a high fantasy world so our book follows two main characters the first is Sol who is the huntress and tracker of the winter mountains and the second character is Kalan I think it's pronounced Kalan and he is a flame skin soldier son of a very important general in his army he has the ability of fire in his blood due to a demon in this world there are a race of people called flame skins which essentially means they have the element of fire which they can produce and control but the fire comes from your pyra which is basically their word for demon so flame skins have like a demon in their head that controls them talks to them a constant companion in their mind and eventually the pyra will overtake the flame skin and possess them so they'll be completely possessed by the demon they become pretty ruthless the entire conflict in this world is between the humans who are trying to eradicate the flame skins because they are a danger and they're burning their villages down and they are evil so the humans are trying to kill the flameskins, including Sol and her family, who highly believe that the flameskins must be eradicated, especially her father. And we have Kleen. But from the flameskins' perspective, they don't see themselves as evil, they see themselves as defending themselves against a genocide of their race, and they just want the ability to live and use their power, not be ostracised from society, although they do go around burning villages and stuff. So we've got the humans killing the flameskins, even like the children, and even flameskins who do nothing wrong, to the flame skins just killing the humans out of retribution and revenge and it's like a never-ending cycle between the flame skins and the humans to a point where you don't remember who started it which is a very apt analogy for how war works where two sides are so deep in conflict that it's not a good side and a bad side there's not the white hats and the black hats and these people just have awful beliefs about the other side even though they don't really know them that is the main conflict of this book which was really interesting and fun to see and our main characters soul and clean if you haven't kind of connected the spoiler Dots. Soul and Clean are mortal enemies in the beginning. We have a human and a flame skin. She is leading a human army to take a princess to a royal and there's like a big trade deal. There's a lot of political elements in there which I won't go into but they were really interesting. So she is leading them because she is an expert of the snowy mountains but Colleen is a flame skin in a camp in this forest. A big disaster happens as everyone dies except Soul and Clean, and they need each other to survive because they've got no weapons, no shelter, no food, no supplies and the two realise pretty quickly that they're going to have to team up to get out of there because Colleen needs Sol to get out because she's an expert at these mountains and he is never going to figure out his way out of this labyrinth winter without her but she needs him because without him she's got no way to hunt because her weapons are destroyed and she needs his warmth because otherwise she's going to freeze to death so the two of them know they need each other to survive their way out of this but of course they're mortal enemies on opposite sides of the war Sol is determined to kill him he wants to kill her before she gets the chance but they end up having this amnesty period where they will try and survive together just to get out of the mountains again 
if you haven't connected the spoilery dots, hate to love romance, <laughs> these two fall in love. The whole story is about them going from these mortal enemies on opposite sides of a war to having to work together begrudgingly to kind of getting to know each other and getting to see each other as human beings and then the two of them fall in love and it becomes this epic star-crossed lovers opposite sides of a war Romeo and Juliet-esque situation where they want to be together but of course the world is not going to accept these two together and there's nowhere really they can hide from either side of the war. It's a really fun story, a completely different read to something I normally read. The hate to love aspect was so well done in my opinion, it's one of the best hate to loves I've ever read and that's because they started off hating each other for legitimate reasons. When I have a hate to love romance they need to hate each other for real reasons and not just petty crap. Second of all, it all made sense, they had to team up to stay alive, they got to know each other with the intimacy in the mountains, it was a slow burn, it didn't rush itself. Going from wanting to kill each other to falling in love seemed totally natural and it was very well written to do so, to get from point A to B and me totally believe it. Hate to love romances could often go really wrong because either they hate each other so much in the beginning it's an abusive icky relationship and it becomes toxic later or that they don't really hate each other enough in the beginning and it just seems a bit soft. This was perfectly done, it was believable that they hated each other and it was believable that they fell in love. So in my personal opinion if you like hate to love romance and if you like high fantasy this book is going to be everything. It is definitely a romance book, heavy on the romance, it was almost cheesy at points which I didn't mind, I was in for the romance ride. Romance isn't a genre I read most but I was into this. During war a soldier who kills a man isn't a murderer, he's a hero. It's that kind of concept, there's no icky toxicness going on which I really appreciate but yet the stakes were really high and all of the problems they had in the relationship was mostly to do with the outside world instead of communication. In fact communication was their asset, the fact that they spent so long in a confined environment growing to get to know each other and having to learn about each other, they weren't forced together. I don't, I don't know if I'm explaining this well, I was all in for the cheese, it wasn't gross or icky in any way so give me the cheese all day long. The fantasy elements really helped for me as well, it helped lift this otherwise regular romance story into an epic high fantasy high stakes world. There was a lot of political interest between the two sides of the war, like I mentioned there was this princess, Sol was trying to lead the human army to a different place to deliver this princess and there was this arranged marriage so that these two army, two kingdoms could connect to help fight the flame skins as one. There was a lot of political elements running through which I thought was very well integrated. The high fantasy definitely didn't take over the romance, the romance is the star and the high fantasy is more like the setting, the backdrop, the accessories. But I really enjoy the high fantasy elements, the magic system was really fun, really well explained, the characterization of our two main characters were great, they both had such personalities to me, I thought their interaction were really really fun. They start off in the mountains but this book doesn't just exist in the mountains, it goes much further on than that. I got to the point where they got out of the mountains and it wasn't even halfway through the book I don't think so there is a lot that happens after they fall in love as well, there's a lot they have to face together. So it's almost like an entire trilogy's worth of content in a single book but it didn't feel rushed, it felt very slow burning but of course I don't want to spoil too much about what happens after because I do want to leave some surprises if you want to read it. This book definitely surprised me in a lot of ways, it went in directions I see coming, I saw a lot more of the kingdom, the fantasy world than I expected and it was a good time. So if you love romance, if you love hate to love and you like healthy romances, cheesy beautifully sweet romances but you also love high fantasy elements and high stakes, this is the book for you. I really recommend it, it was a really nice way to start my month. Okay the next two books I read were audiobooks, it was while I was finishing painting my living room, you might have known I moved into this house, so I've had two last audiobooks to finish off with. I had Live and Laughing by Michael McIntyre, I know, I listened to it again, I'm not even ashamed. <laughs> Michael McIntyre is one of my favourite comedians, I love his autobiography, it's always a fun listen. I listened to that, last month I listened to that, I listened to Lee Evans' his autobiography and then I went back to Michael's and listened to it for a second time. It's kind of addictive, every time I reach the end of the book I just want to go straight back to the beginning. And the second audiobook I read was a really small one to listen to and it was really sweet and that was Fantastic Mr Fox by Roald Dahl. I recently read Matilda back in July during the reading rush, you might know, I listened to Matilda again which I hadn't read in years and had so much fun with, so I thought I'd listen to Fantastic Mr Fox, it was only like an hour long, it was super short but it was really cute and I'd forgotten most of it. The Matilda film helped support the book in my mind, I remember that a lot more because I watched that film a million times growing up, so I remember the Matilda book a lot more than I remember the Fantastic Mr Fox book. So it's fun to go back and remember the characters and the situation and what was happening and it was just a really cute little story. That's kind of all I have to say, 
so we'll move straight on. Going from light fluffy childhood, let's go in the opposite direction, shall we? The next book I read was Librarian of Auschwitz by Antonio Iturb and translated by Lilith Zekelin Thwaites, I think. Man, it's so nerve wracking saying those names because I'm sorry if I butchered them, oh god. So The Librarian of Auschwitz is about as heavy as it sounds it's gonna be. The Librarian of Auschwitz is a fictional story but it is based on the true story of Dieter Kraut, who was a young girl from Prague who survived and lived through the Holocaust and Auschwitz. So Dieter Krauts is a real woman who really survived and the beginning of the book there is this letter from Dieter Krauts explaining how her and the author met and how she shared so many of her experiences and how the author used that to help him write this story. I have no idea where to differentiate the fiction from the fact but a lot of it is so realistic that I can only assume it's pretty close other than a few narrative plot changes that he might have invented. Her experiences were dead real which was terrifying because reading the book was like reading a historical fiction autobiographical event. But before I get into that I didn't know who Dieter Kraps was and I think that was actually a crime because everyone knows who Anne Frank is, everyone knows that story. But Dieter Kraps lived through the Holocaust, she went through Auschwitz, she went to the worst camps that there was and she survived and she is still alive in 2020. She's still alive. She's 91 years old. I looked this woman up and this woman is incredible. You can look up interviews of her in the past couple of years. This girl went through literally one of the worst historical periods, the worst event, some of the most horrific things you can imagine. And this woman is alive and thriving and full of passion. This woman may be my new hero. She is incredible. I just recommend, even if you don't read the book, a oh, bit heavy for me, doesn't sound like my thing, at least look up Dieter Krauts because it's incredible and it's uplifting to see that she is just living. I want to meet Dieter Krauts. She sounds like an amazing person to talk to. But anyway, let's talk about the book The Librarian of Auschwitz. So the book follows young Dieter who gets taken from her home in Prague and ends up in Auschwitz and she has to survive in this horrific landscape and there is this specific camp of people of a few adults who are looking after all the children of Auschwitz and they are the family camp. Under the Nazis rule the children are not allowed to be educated but they could let them take the children off the adults hands so that the adults could go to work and work themselves to death so this family camp exists as basically like a babysitting service to keep the kids away from the adults who are working. But notes to the Nazis, the family camp does and sets up a secret school where they're teaching the kids and giving these little Jewish kids an education despite where they are, their seeming lack of a future, they still want to educate these kids and Dieter Krauts has a major role in that because she is in charge of looking after the few precious books that got smuggled into Auschwitz and she is therefore the librarian of Auschwitz in charge of this huge responsibility because if the books are found the Nazis will know what they're doing and they will surely die. Dieter takes this responsibility with relish, she treasures over these books, she loves them, she takes care of them and is highly responsible over these books and the story is about her and her survival, family, just seeing the death and destruction around her, trying to survive in this landscape. It is is horrific to watch or read. You can imagine it's awful. It doesn't shy up on any of the details. If you're squeamish and you don't want to hear any thoughts, you go to the time scamp and skip. About body horror or death or anything like that, you might want to skip it. Let's get in. Some of the most horrific things happen in this camp and the detail is so gory and horrific. There are scenes of the soldiers shoving women and children into gas chambers. There were scenes of them clawing to get their way out. There was this scene after that where the soldiers had to clean up corpses and the defecation. There was a lot of shit after the gas chamber <laughs> because people were so terrified they would shit themselves. This whole chamber was a filthy den of corpses and ash and human remains of all kinds. There was a guard who pissed in a woman's face during it. So many details. <laughs> if you don't like bodily functions, this book ain't for you. <laughs> the prisoners of Auschwitz, as you probably know, were treated worse than animals. They were treated so badly. Hundreds of people thrown into a single room just to sleep on floors. They were just crawling on top of each other and there was lice. There was a whole lot of diseases that were awful to see. Starvation, corpses and the whole lot. And it was horrible to read. I know I seem to be zooming and focusing in on the physical body horrors but it's just because there's something so sickening about the physical aspect and that's just not even including the mental horrific anguish. This entire book is surrounded by the cloud of you're in the death factory. So many moments 
moments where Dee's just, just walking around and it's snowing ash. That was people. So many sad moments of kids finding a crumb, being so excited to find a crumb on the floor. The women trying to prostitute themselves to every guard in sight just so they might live another day. So many horrifically real moments that are so filled with humanity, sadness and desperation. It was just so heartbreaking but also heartwarming in a way. Although it was just surrounded by a shroud of horror, there was also so many beautiful moments. The fact that these people, this family camp was fighting to give the kids an education, even during this, I think that's incredible that they did that. When the kids were learning and smiles on their faces when they could touch a book, even though it had no front cover and it had pages missing, these books were so precious to them. And all of those moments defied the Nazis and they fought for the smallest little pieces of happiness. There were so many brave characters, so many acts of bravery that were unimaginable, beautiful in this horrible situation. There were so many great characters in this story. Dieter was a great character. You also have the leader of the family camp. You had the guard who was trying to turn against his own kind and escape because he didn't want to be there. You had Jewish leader. Oh, I can't remember they had a special name but they were like kind of traitorous because they got special perks. His attempts to work with the resistance. The characters were just so filled with humanity. So realistic of people. There was Dr. Mangle. I think his name was Mangle which is kind of funny now I think about it. He was the scientist and as you may know about the Holocaust there was a lot of experiments done on Jewish children. A lot of twins were experimented on. Since you know they were so disposable you might as well make some scientific jumps in research. He was a great baddie because he didn't seem too cartoony. He seemed so quietly menacing just the way he would walk around humming. It was chilling. There's also this moment nearer the end of the book where she mentions being in this room full of dying, starving, diseased women and she mentions a certain girl and her sister who are in bed sick and that girl's name was Anne. I didn't think anything of it till at the end of the chapter she said and that girl Anne just so happened to wrote a diary which one day would become famous and become known as the diary of Anne Frank. I remember reading that line, that was paraphrasing it, but I remember reading that line and going she was in the same room as Anne Frank. Like I said, I don't know what's fiction and what's real. I don't know if Dieter Krauss ever actually was in the same room as Anne Frank, but whether it's real or not, it was a great little Easter egg detail. When they mentioned this girl Anne, I didn't even, she was just a girl called Anne. I didn't twig, it was Anne Frank. So it was this fun little detail. And by this time, near the end of the book, I know Dieter Krauss so well. I know this character. Anne Frank went completely out of my mind. Anne Frank isn't the only one who went through this. And Dieter Krauss's story is amazing. She deserves to be known. The story was so well written. The one of the things that I was worried about going into this book was the writing because historically with historical fictions for me I tend to think sometimes the writing can be quite janky, quite hard to read, quite dense. I've just found that with a lot of historical fictions. They tend to be pretty rough, highly complex and this book was written by a Spanish author and interpreted into English when you add the extra element of a translation probably going to be even more janky and weird since it's a translated book and yet it was so beautifully well written. The writing was as smooth as you could get. It was so easy to read. The content of the book was horrific and awful but reading it was an absolute breeze because of the writing. I was so impressed. It was very intelligent, nuanced. It was just magnificent and I couldn't believe how smooth it was. Normal historical fiction book can feel a little jank to me. It was beautifully nuanced but it was definitely an adult written book because you can have both. I hate when people are like oh it's adult so it's gonna be mature and hard to read. No, I don't jive with that. You can have a maturely written story that's still a smooth ride. The words were complex, the ideas were complex and nuanced, but it was easy but smooth to read. I was so impressed by the writing style. It made the book a breeze. It was such a beautiful story, so beautifully written. I loved this book. Yes, it was hard to read because of how awful the content was, how real it was. At the same time, it was so easy to read because of the writing and there was so many moments that were just so beautiful. I highly recommend this. If you don't think historical fiction's for you, if you like me think sometimes it can be a bit hard to read, I highly recommend this book. I thought it was beautifully written. Even if you don't have the commitment to read this book, just look up who Dieter Krauss was because hero! <laughs> this book was fantastic. I talked about Internment, a book I read recently. This would blow that out of the water. I did love Internment but it did have its issues. This book was its mature older cousin. I don't believe the book was written 
written to be some kind of torture porn. I know that that's what a lot of people might say. This book was so nuanced and beautifully written. I don't think that's the case. Me personally, I think learning about this history is important. It's awful that it happened, but they had to live through it. The least I can do is read about it. Reading about Auschwitz, oh, how horrible. I could never. Imagine going through it. They didn't have a choice. This was the awful event that was forced upon them. The least I can do is know about it. I think it's so important for us to know history, especially in these awful moments of history, because we never want them to happen again. If we don't learn and if we don't know these important historical events, they will repeat themselves. Sometimes it's good to be grateful, admire and appreciate the people that have been through this shit. I'm sorry if you think that's torture porn, but I think it's a lesson we all need to know. And if it was up to me, this book would be required reading. As far as I'm concerned, we could all learn and know about this stuff. I am so glad that I gave this book the chance and I loved it. Thanks, Annie. I didn't mention my mother-in-law lent this book to me. She's been retired recently and she's been burning through my book recommendations. She always comes around to see my library and I lend her books. Yes, I give her my books to borrow because trust. That's so much faith I have in Annie. She always reads them and brings them back to me in perfect condition. She's one of the real ones. <laughs> I'm lending her books all the time and that was one she lent me. Very happy I was able to read it as well so I could give it back to her that she could have it back. So thanks Annie because I wanted to read that one anyway so it was great that you had it. Thanks Annie. Next up in September I went on holiday for a few days. I went to Devon to sit on a beach with my boyfriend. It was lovely, my favourite location in the world. I've been there every year since I was a baby. This place is my heart. Before we left I ran to my library and went oh need to pick a book. I haven't read that. Go. So I just grabbed it, ran out the door, didn't remember what it was about, shoved it in the car and left. And that was The Truth About Lies by Tracy Darnton. I picked this book pretty much because I hadn't read it yet and it had a picture of a pool on the cover. It seemed to suit my holiday so I just grabbed it and left. I got to the beach, I sat down ready to read my book in the sunshine. I opened it up and found out it's set in Devon. <laughs> I grabbed this book without knowing that. I drove four hours across the country only to find out that I picked the one book that's on my shelf that's probably set in Devon and took it to Devon. That kind of felt like it was meant to be. It was a bit spooky at the time when I opened it. I'm in Devon. It's like I had a psychic connection with the book. It's like I knew. Anyway, this book is a contemporary mystery with really, really elements following this girl who has a ridiculously good memory. This girl has a photographic memory, an eidetic memory, all the types of memory. She has such a hyper memory brain. She remembers literally everything since she was 11 years old. You could ask her about a specific day seven years ago and ask her what the weather was and what she was wearing that day and she would remember every single detail pretty flawlessly and be able to see it all in her mind and replay it. She had this whole mind library in her head where she would go through and open her little files in her imagination and she had all this information swirling through her brain replaying everything and it was a really interesting idea for a story. I don't think this hyper memory is real. I'm pretty sure the author said at the end of the book that there is some realistic elements, the eidetic and the photographic, but the actual memory this girl has is abnormal. She kind of made it up and exaggerated what this memory could do. It was an exploration of what if those people who do have extraordinary memories had even better memories. And it was an interesting topic of discussion. This book is about this girl with the hyper memory who is in Devon running away from her past. She has a new name and she's running from something at the beginning of the book. You don't really know what happened in her past but you know something bad happened to make her completely change her identity and go incognito in a new place. She remembers everything that ever happens and at the beginning we have her roommate Hannah who jumped out a window and committed suicide. You're learning about that event and everything that led up to that event and our main character's involvement and also what happened in her previous life and everything coming to catch up with her. Her old life isn't done with her yet and it's coming to get her. Her old life is not a great place. There was a lot of ominous. The ending of the book got a little bit more thrillery with it coming back to get her. Most of the book is a mystery, uncovering all these pieces, trying to put together what happened to Hannah and what happened in her old life and learning more and more about her and what really happened. And also figuring out if her memory is as infallible as she believes. It was a really fun exercise in seeing what memory is like and just discussing memory. At the beginning of every chapter, there's like a little memory trick. You know, like those books where improving your memory, tips and tricks to help improve your memory, that kind of thing. There was even this class about memory and this 
teacher teaching them how to improve their memory and all these class were doing projects on memory exercises and she was having to pretend that she didn't already have this genius memory and understanding that so other people have to you know think about these things and try and remember that just comes to her and everyone thinking oh having a super memory would be so fantastic but our main character sees it as a curse because she wishes she had the ability to get things and there's a constant playing in her mind of every trauma she's ever gone through it's like a movie replaying over and over that she can't control so much information in this girl's head that she feels so weighed down by the amount of memories and her head just sounds like an exhausting place to be <laughs> it was a fun book i loved mystery i thought it was well written the pacing was nice and slow not like boring but it was just a nice slowly developed mystery as you uncover more and more pieces thought the characters were very interesting our main character is such an interesting person not just because of the memory but also her personality what she's been through you know there are traumatic experiences because of the way she reacts to situations closed off nature her lack of trust we've got a romantic subplot in here with a boy which is really really cute this friendship group which is a really interesting dynamic because they're friends but they're not really like friends and it's interesting because realistically in life we end up hanging out with people a lot of the times in school that we don't really like they got on our nerves we think they're pricks we think they're self-obsessed and we don't always like the friendship groups we hang out in and i found that really interesting to see this friendship group this dynamic and this main character not really feel like one of them not really feel like she likes them but that's the way life is sometimes so that was interesting to read about and like they weren't horrible people but they were all coping with things in their own ways and sometimes people just aren't for you the shall i say villains in this story they were nice and intimidating and spooky and the ending really did pick up the stake and have a few really good twists in there there was a lot i didn't see coming it, it wouldn't be impossible to guess what happened i just was reading it nice and casually i was on holiday after all it's not too much of a thinker <laughs> you just kind of uncover things as you go slowly unfog this mystery have discussions about memory and psychology and it's it's a fun time i really enjoyed it it's a mystery it's not a thriller if you're hoping for a gigantic thrill ride it's probably not it but if you're looking for a mysterious interesting topical nicely written book i really enjoyed it it wasn't groundbreaking in any way it wasn't hyper realistic the author admits probably isn't that realistic memory wise it was more of like a case study is if this girl had this amazing memory that was this good what would she be like and it kind of was based off that and her characterization exploring the topic i found it really fun and i enjoyed it the main character is a swimmer which is why the front cover she's in a pool she finds swimming very relaxing i really enjoyed the story this is one of those wild card books i just picked up in waterstones one time ah those were the days i read through it really quickly especially since i was on holiday and i found myself wanting to keep reading it had to be hooked enough that i wanted to know what was going to happen i wanted to know more information i love this setting as well because it was in devon and i was in devon and i recognized a lot of the signs of devon like fog and the moors it wasn't exactly in devon as like i was it wasn't coastside it was more like countryside if that sounds interesting to you i recommend it it was a fun time and the last book i read in september i haven't yet finished oops so i'm reading the eighth girl by may fung chung i think i said that right i'm sorry if i didn't this book is my third net galley book look at me go and this one i'm not sure we'll see i'll talk about it more maybe in my october wrap up because i haven't finished it and i hate talking about books i haven't finished yet it's interesting it's about a girl with multiple personality disorder i don't know i'm not gonna lie i'm a bit bored it's not really hooking me i like learning about different mental health disorders and i'm interested to know if the mental health aspect of the multiple person personality disorder or it's not called that anymore it's called dissociative identity disorder i think i know it's called did i just can't say words apparently and i just want to know if that's accurately represented in the book i think it is right from the off we know she has dissociative identity disorder why is that hard to say we know she has did so it's not like a thriller where at the end oh no it's her because she has multiple personality ah she's the murderer which i'm glad about she has this from the beginning although it does have thrillery mystery vibes so i'm really hoping this doesn't come back to me in the arse and that ends up what happening i don't think it will like i said we're really getting to know our main character i don't think she's an ominous psycho murderer as most thrillers would have you believe but she also has this therapist which is a bit ominous he hasn't done anything but i don't know just the way he talks about her being fascinating and beautiful i don't know there's something ominous about it that i'm worried about he's gonna do something ew 
And then there's this other also paedophilic style characters like this club owner who's got her best friend to work for him. It's like a strip club but the boss seems very creepy and so I'm worried about where that's going. So is our main character. I don't have DID, I don't know anyone with DID. So although I really want to learn about this disorder, I have no frame of reference whether this is realistic or not. That is important to me. So I'd like to read some like own voice reviews to know whether this is realistic or not because I wouldn't know. I have no idea. It seems realistic to me. It seems natural, not over sensationalized, but I have no way of knowing that for certain unless I ask and look. So I would like to find out that because it needs to be realistic otherwise look has got nothing going for it. It's fine, a little bit ominous, but also I'm a bit bored. We'll see, maybe that book will turn itself around. You'll have to find out in October's wrap up. And that was my wrap up for September. I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching these videos. They're a lot of work. I know they don't seem like a lot of work, but then they take a lot of time out of my day to edit and I really should be spending this time doing other things. So I really want to try and cut back a little bit on this time I spend editing because it's too much. But thank you for watching. Give it a like if you want. Talk to me in the comments about any of these books if you have any opinions. Thanks for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye!